Thank you. Um, John, thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's amazing to see a crowd underground here when it's so extraordinary outside. Um, Michael and I are really thrilled and honored to be here uh, this evening because the theme here about what is architecture now, what is design now, what, it, what is the value of our moment is a very pressing one. And, and for us, when we think about what Stanford really embodies, it really looks at the kind of lateral terrain of what the challenges are that face the world and look at the possibility of every discipline coming together to reach solutions that are unprecedented. And so for us, uh, this multidisciplinary approach is really the approach that inspired our look at architecture, landscape, infrastructure, art, ecology, to ask questions about how do we build and what's the impact of what we build on this incredibly fragile earth that we um, obviously are occupying. And when we think about the complex and fragile world that we occupy and we think about the work that we're going to do, the question of what it means to shape a broader public realm and terrain is something that we become convinced is one of the most important questions we can ask. And we actually started our practice with a dissatisfaction of the idea of the ideal of architecture, this perfect object on the unfettered landscape. Um, but in fact, we wondered what would happen if architecture, art, infrastructure, engineering, and ecology might actually be cohabiting that same terrain so that a broader question and a broader territory for design could be addressed. And if reciprocity between these uh, agendas could actually come to bear, then we decided that we could look at each project as an opportunity, both in terms of the site and the program, to think about how we could actually go beyond, transcend that object, perfect object on the landscape, to think about how the programs could avoid uh, disciplinary distinctions and avoid site boundaries to actually become something larger than they might be otherwise. So this evening, um, we'll share a set of sustained preoccupations through 10 projects. They're evolving experiments in the creation of what we would call a more elastic definition of design, one that connects the loose ends of architecture, ecology, and infrastructure to create what we hope is a new form of public nature. In fact, this increasingly fluid and dynamic zone, which we think is crucial to how we practice as architects at this moment, um, is both crucial to the site and the inspiration and the trajectory of our work. For us, architecture is interdisciplinary and collaborative, and it's important to note that the projects that we'll share with you this evening, tonight, also reflect a collective talents and commitments of members of our studio. Mary and I are privileged to represent work that um, embodies efforts not only by uh, our own studio, but by clients, collaborators, fellow engineers, who are all willing to imagine a more elastic and open-ended interpretation of each project's boundaries. So the slide of the world is maybe a start, <clears throat> and it's a modest start uh, maybe for all of us to be reminded that we actually have a very, very uh, small, short period of time to affect something that actually has a more sustained time. You could call it this era of global responsibility um, is an important era because we're reminded now within that context that architecture is fundamentally a social art. Um, but it's a social art that engages a hybrid terrain that is, you could say, begging for the new and novel, uh, for some people who look at architecture as new and novel, but in our thoughts, really needs to ask, ask larger questions about how to transform a site at every scale to recast the terms of what is individual and what is collective and what is natural and what is public. Hmm. So perhaps the most common ground these projects share is the uncommon intersection of the section, literally from the datum of the sky through the earth to the subsurface. And it's the capacity, the thickness of that section to do more work is part of the work that we find uh, really challenging, particularly with the topographic preoccupation that's led us to actually consider a different territory for architecture, one that has a synthetic approach and one that has a sort of lateral expansive and unlimited terrain for design. So this has been a very inspiring image for us. These are the Nazca Lines in Peru, 400, 650 AD. This wedge, if you will, is a mark uh, that's about a third of a mile long. And it really reflects the fact that this was an um, impulse, ostensibly for some astrological purposes, 
that says that this is an impulse that we have to shape the land. But then when you think about infrastructure and the social art, the section um, that you can see here with the Spanish Steps, a project that we did not do, but um, <laughs> um, an extraordinary one nonetheless, where the need to be able to move from the high ground to the low ground in, in this particular location in Rome was one where it was expanded in width and territorial bravura and theater to become something larger than simply a sectional connection. So, if we then think about what this sectional work can do when we think about the speeds of infrastructure affecting and inflecting uh, a public terrain, Le Corbusier certainly had the ideal of cohabiting, even in as early as 1929, cohabiting the car whizzing down the midsection of a tower, if you will, that could spread itself along the ground so you could be on your porch with coffee while a car passed right underneath you. Now, that fantasy is not so unreal because right in our backyard in Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn Heights Promenade is really a case where Robert Moses' desire to actually bust through the Brooklyn Queens Expressway through a tiny community generated. Um, here, the idea of bunk bed urbanism, where you could actually have the northbound lane, southbound, tucked under uh, a promenade a third of a mile long above, and then actually local traffic below, all leveraging the section, if you will, the city, so that this highway <coughs> didn't have to, or expressway didn't have to cut through a community, but could cut along the edge of a community. We found this actually very, very inspiring because the engineering here, when you think of what Clark and Rapuana, even as landscape architects did when they did this, was that they created a public terrain and high functioning multi-speed terrains in one terrain. So if we shift scales and look at these incredible juxtapositions, we're perpetually provoked by the power of natural and unnatural forces, controlled and increasingly uncontrolled mobilities. So today, in the face of so many simultaneous challenges, perhaps the challenge for design is less a consolidating ideal, but rather a more instrumental project with thickness and depth that intensifies social, cultural, and natural reciprocities. So the unintended vulnerabilities that you see here so beautifully and hauntingly captured in the Ewan Bond photo of New York right around Hurricane Sandy allows us to think perhaps more deeply about the sort of temporary resilience of art and science, where entropy, so vividly expressed with Robert Smithson's spiral jetty, can be both embraced and leveraged. Similarly, Piranesi and Duchamp, uh, not a juxtaposition that one would typically uh, put forward, but these simultaneous potentials for us raise deeper questions about interior and social landscapes, equally as important as the kind of ecological and cultural landscapes. Is there a possibility for a more topographically and sectionally active project where movement up through over offers possibilities for a more continuous territory of design? So each challenge is highly specific for us. Each project is highly specific. And we've been trying to understand the possibilities of creating a new kind of public nature, one project at a time. So we'll start with not our first project, but for us an extraordinarily important project, which is the Museum of the Earth. Not an unambitious title. I think the director had uh, great and very, very powerful ambitions to link the history, the current history, the biological and the geological history, to understand um, how the Earth evolved. And as a paleontologist, biology and geology are inextricably linked. It's located. Um, uh, in the Finger Lakes region of New York, part of Cornell University. And what was so dramatic about this site after much study is you can see what's quite obvious is at the edge of the Finger Lakes, you can start to see the traces of the receding ice age. And here, in a very, very significant and a very profound way, you can understand this incredible synergy between geology and biology. The site itself is this fairly, relatively uh, steep slope. But what you see on the far right is the sort of emergence of water. And the presence of water in this region is crucial. And what better way to document the power and capacity of water to change our environment than to kind of think about it as part of the pedagogy of this museum, this tiny little museum 
that talks about paleontology. And in fact, the power of water creates spaces that are supremely architectural, the gorges of Ithaca, extraordinarily beautiful, and for us, very, very inspirational for this particular project. It was also here that we realized for the first time that the power of constructing a site, the power of seeing architecture in a reciprocal relationship with landscape was far more powerful, hence the sort of whole being greater than the sum of the parts. So the sense is that we tried to construct the site and you can see a series of parking terraces that do double duty. Not only do they serve the prosaic need to park cars, but also by terracing and gently sculpting a landscape, we could catch water, which is precious even in an area like upstate New York. And there we can let the kind of idea of collecting water, draining it, cleaning it, and then ultimately discharging it into Lake Cayuga become a powerful, not only a metaphor, but a very literal way of conveying an important ecological message. So the museum is actually tucked into the earth, and we like to think that it starts with a very, very quick and subtle inscription up at the top with the parking lots, so that the shaping of the earth is as important as the shaping of the architecture itself. So you come in at an upper level and then descend, and in so doing, hopefully start to understand the importance and the enormity of the passage of time. This is also an opportunity not to think only in terms of a kind of black box museum, which is very typical for science museums. You kind of enter into a completely controlled environment. But here we really wanted to remind folks that what was happening outside in this incredible landscape was part of a much more ancient landscape that you could see identified in these incredible fossil collections which are housed in this tiny museum. So the museum, in a way, is broken into two pavilions. It makes a kind of gorge, if you will, and you can start to see how that entry plaza is shaped by a series of parking lots which sort of essentially cascade down and find their way into the museum. Little apocryphal story, um, all of this discussion about water allowed us to kind of think of the making of these water terraces which would be filled with water. And of course, the museum opened and it was a drought not a speck of water for about a year. And fortunately, uh, uh, the next year, uh, we had enormous snowfalls and lots of water. So in a way, the kind of engine of the site allowed us to make this sort of very important point. So here you see the building tucked itself into the earth. It uses the earth uh, in a way to both heat and cool the building, to temper those cycles. Sometimes it emerges in a very, very significant architectonic way. Um, but we like the idea that, in a way, it is um, a machine for telling this story. So you enter uh, within sort of clear sight of uh, your own moment in time, and you're confronted with a skeleton of a right whale, a contemporary mammal. And as you descend this ramp, you can see the little, not so little, dark rock. It's a Devonian rock with a series of incredibly beautiful skeletons, and you can start to understand the skeletal structure in the Devonian rock as being related to that of the right whale. We collect water, we bring it into a kind of glacial garden. There it gets discharged and collected, frozen. It's beautiful in the winter, in fact. Uh, in Ithaca, it's winter probably three quarters of the year. Um, and um, at night, too, the kind of concrete is left rough and raw, so you can understand how limestone works and how sedimentary rock works. And then finally, water is captured. At this point, it's been cleaned by a series of equisetum uh, berms in the parking lot. And uh, what you see is the detention basin uh, before water is let clean into Lake uh, Cayuga upon opening day. And now it's actually a very thriving ecosystem that in a way, uh, I think, proves the point that nature is a relentless collaborator, whether we want it or not. A, a very different project in a very, very different um, continent. Uh, this is in Muju, Korea, and we were asked to design the Taekwondo Park Master Plan. And it's an incredibly beautiful setting. Muju, Korea has uh, a very topographically rich uh, landscape. It's part of southern Korea. And what we were uh, really inspired by was the sense that the landscape could be a kind of companion 
to Taekwondo, and it's not such a stretch because Taekwondo is not just a martial arts in Korea. It's a way of living. It's a way of, uh, of thinking uh, and has strong philosophical roots. The competition brief, in a way, was written like many competitions. Uh, you had this incredibly fragile, beautiful site. And unfortunately, the thought was to place seven, in this case, iconic buildings in the middle of what we thought was an incredibly fragile valley. And we thought that was completely antithetical to both the beauty of this site, but also to the, the, the kind of philosophical underpinnings of Taekwondo. So the idea was to take the program and think of it less as architecture and more as landscape. So it starts to measure and give definition to this incredible topography and also recall the fantastic history of agriculture in this part of Korea. So the program then gets distributed into a series of strands that we loosely call the body, mind, and spirit. The body being the arena, the very active part, mind being the um, academy where you would learn about Taekwondo. And then finally, a new program element that we added, the spirit, which is a place of contemplation. So the valley in turn is crisscrossed by a series of paths and bridges that in a way allude to the sense that Taekwondo is a progression of learning. Similarly, the kind of role of water in this particular valley is extremely important and like the Museum of the Earth becomes a kind of narrative and a way of defining the architecture. So water is collected, used, not just in a picturesque way but in a very performative way that allows us also to think about the kind of landscape and the reintroduction of this incredible history of cultivation on the site. So uh, what we were really intrigued with, the idea of mind, body, and spirit also being associated with the ascent of this particular site, nearly 200 feet to ascend actually from the lower level to the upper level. Um, and the cross valley is actually creating settings now where we could actually house the programs in a unique way, not filling up the valley and blocking the water streams, but pulled back so we could allow the water to flow and actually host the program in these cross valleys. The first one being here, the place of the arena. This is where all the national competitions are held. Uh, and we envision this place of competition actually as something that could pull forward the Korean uh, sort of gift, if you will, of these Celadon uh, sort of potteries that are so famous and national treasures made translucent to host the competition on a body of water, in this case, that is large and still. And that if we actually ascend up the hill, the second cross valley where the mind is, the school would not be a series of buildings as had been written in the, the program brief for us, but actually a continuous and habitable contour of this cross valley to become this school that has the library, the swimming areas, the classrooms, the training grounds, and that main green. So that even in the winter time, Muju, well known not only for its ginseng, but also for its skiing, uh, is something that could be accommodated on the roofscape. And then, of course, the uh, pool itself at a ceremonial uh, objective view, if you will, in the valley and the counterpoint to that. But all of this then said that when we reached the place of the spirit, the whole program associated with the spa, we felt that could be seen through the dappled light of water in these terraces so that, like the subterranean space we're in right now, that would be illuminated by water, but barely legible, so that when you reach this uppermost territory, the sense of architecture has left you, and the place of the spirit is all you can see. Um, now, when you do competitions in uh, some parts of the world, they have what they call a turnkey system, which is that your designs are handed over to a contractor who then brings in architects and engineers to complete it, and every now and again they introduce new themes, and uh, theoretically, let's just say that the Celadon didn't make it, but virtually everything else did. So you can see the actual built project here. Um, but in a place that actually has even more uh, interesting ways of getting things done, or as you could say, sometimes challenged to get things done, um, in Washington, D.C., we recently won the competition for the Sylvan Theater. Uh, and this is actually an amazing story on the National Mall in Washington. Uh, Alice Pike Barney in 1917 said that we need a cultural place where our voices could be heard in the most democratic of all senses in an outdoor theater on the Mall. Now, if you look at that, it really is the voice of democracy is really seen and heard there in the mall. But when you looked at the actual theater that was ultimately realized, it's a very strange, kind of sad, plywood brown painted box that has found its way sort of 
sort of belligerently sidelined by security means. And you can start to see it. And, and worse still, it is uh, right in front of all the tour buses that are dropped off at the mall. And so we thought, rather than rebuild it, what would happen if we rethought it and actually recognized that it wasn't really at just the shoulder of the kind of monumental corridor of the mall, but it was literally at the center between the tidal basin and the mall. And if it could be central, we could also connect these landscapes and simultaneously rethink the tragic flaw of looking towards a piece of plywood and tour buses, but actually invert that paradigm to say, what if the audience and the stage was somehow seen against uh, the Washington Monument, so the great symbol of democracy could be at the forefront of every performance. So we thought in this most delicate of all landscapes, how little can we do to seat 10,000 people? And so really the question was, could we lift the land ever so slightly? And in lifting it also host the program of the pavilion, which would be a place to actually eat on the mall, which is very hard to find. Um, and could we take this strange assembly of things, you know, the, the theater, the bus, the mound, the security items, lift the land to create this new valley, if you will, between the mound that hosts the Washington Monument and now the theater and the stage itself. And in the process of doing that, you could see that we were able to lift the land to conceal the buses at the same time. So in taking the Sylvan here, you could say that there's a central stage there, kind of an arena stage, um, and then concealing uh, what's happening right behind and blocking it through landmass, the sound of those buses, we could actually design a kind of chameleon section that sort of fol follows the fulcrum from the Washington Monument and then introduces the Sylvan Canopy, which never existed. It was only a fiction in name, but that Sylvan can Canopy could carry the landscape from the mall across and into, and then we could actually host three different scales of performance, 100, 1,000, and 10,000, so that the Washington Monument included all those scales of performance, and ultimately be a place where the synthesis now of these two landscapes of the tidal basin and the monument could be connected by this uppermost terrace in a kind of plan that looks as if it was barely changed at all, but somehow transforming what is really this strange situation now into a place it could host a performance for 10,000. Um, and that we could also reframe the historic gateway with a new pavilion that also is just a secondary lift of the land. This is what you'd see coming out of the metro. Um, but you could also have an intimate gathering, an intimate gathering where even in the winter time, you could actually be inside the pavilion looking out on what would then become probably a sledding hill, but music and performance could happen inside this pavilion. Um, this being Washington, fundraising is at its beginning. Um, we're patient. Uh, but our hope is that somehow the inspiration and the dream of this <laughs> is going to be inspiring others to contribute <laughs> to its possibility. Um, so uh, some of the inspiration, in fact, we're very grateful that one of the key funders actually took a tour with us of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden to understand how we could actually simultaneously be a building and be a landscape, which was a hard concept to swallow. But here we were able to do exactly that with the Brooklyn Botanic Garden to allow their gateway and their visitor center from the city into their great garden could be a little bit of both. Um, at Mother's Day, they get uh, and advertised, I think, 44,000 people over the course of that weekend, and all of them shuttle through this strange little egg beater of an entry, or did so before. Um, and we thought that that was an unfortunate way to arrive at the garden. And we started to wonder about what would be the possibility if we thought paradigmatically about a, a, a sort of a visitor center that was 50% architecture and 50% landscape, that it would begin at the city and somehow when it's made its way fully in the garden, it would disappear. Um, made our client nervous, actually. Um, but the real question was, how could we tie this building into something that really, you know, grew out of all the systems of water and landscape and the Olmstedian vision, and actually could take an idea here where it could be 100% urban in its setting, welcoming in its nature, could host all their sort of garden shows, et cetera, on the outside of the city, and insinuate itself in section, literally along this MRI path, if you will, so that it would become nearly invisible when it reached the garden over 440 feet later. And you could see the section here, literally tracking the topography and collaborating with it across this 22-foot grade change. And then literally structuring the paths to be almost as if they were shaded and wisteria-laden trellises that had been translated to steel and glass, um, so that they could guide your journey into the visitor center. 
And literally, if you see this picture at a certain time of day, in fact, the sunlight tracks through the glass and does lead you to the front door. Um, but these curved geometries were not just following contours and topography, but they were also following the drip lines of trees. And this is one of our country's only green flowering cherry trees. And the drip line was very, very important. That generated that secondary curvature. But those dual curvatures of coming from the city or coming around that cherry tree generated some interesting places to make important choices. Choices that would bring you either inside the visitor center with its gallery or through into the garden, always being reminded of the garden, of being able to see those exhibits and see outside exactly what those exhibits were about. And in the case of one of the more important political moves um, for the garden, the ginkgo tree that had to be removed to allow this to happen was kiln dried, recycled, and then created the acoustical paneling in this only two-sided room that can seat 160. Um, it's an amazing room. It's leaf-shaped. And there you can see the recycled ginkgo, a lot of work to actually integrate the, um, the mechanical systems, which you see there with the pukas. Um, but it's one that actually had a kind of sectional story that Michael will talk about. So the room is actually quite, quite narrow. And um, the idea is it becomes a kind of lens. And this building is actually approached from two sides. And we wanted very much to think about the movement of architecture through, over, and around this building. Because in a way, the idea of a visitor center is that it's an introduction to a botanic garden in this case. It wasn't an end unto itself. So you can start to see how that path starts, the secondary path. Marion described the primary path, which is from the city. Secondary path, which is at an upper elevation, allows us to really start to look through and across the building. It has a green roof, which in a way is the building's fifth facade. So you slide through, under, and then over, and you get another kind of glimpse uh, from the upper balcony. And then finally you slide down and kind of understand the spatial characteristics of this room, but more importantly, it allows you to see different parts of the garden in a way that hadn't been possible. Parts that were now seen had not been seen. So that sort of sense of the architecture and the landscape merging is particularly evident in the easternmost edge of the building. And this was a sort of gesture that, and a kind of set of geometries that are not just picturesque, and of course they are in some ways, and they're certainly spatial, but also performative. So the green roof allows us to catch water as do a series of rain gardens. Those allow the water then to be caught, discharged into a, a Japanese garden, a pond, a very beautiful pond, and then finally slowly uh, let into a larger lake at the other end of the garden. So the sense of water and water management, the kind of ecological imperative, becomes part of the driver and the shaping of architecture. So too is the roof, which is a kind of an experimental uh, setting for the garden. And here, the sort of sense that this architecture of the roof, the landscape architecture of the roof, would always change, forever sort of being tested and experimenting. We love the idea that the building becomes, in a way, a laboratory. So you can start to see that laboratory early fall. The kind of the green is starting to get a kind of robust orange. Perhaps at times in the winter, it kind of pokes out of all the snow we've had. So we've had a chance to sort of see the roof almost as it disappears. Here you see it in full fall, which has this kind of beautiful russet color. And of course, when it was just planted, it has sort of light green. So it mirrors the seasons and in a way intensifies the seasonal change. And our hope is that the architecture allows us to understand our environment. Well, that environment is made of many constituents. No one anticipated that uh, ducks would find our roof attractive. We're flattered, um, even more flattered uh, by these two little, uh, aren't they cute? I mean, it's to die for. This being New York, they pay $1,500 a month for their little studio. <laughs> um, but at times, the architecture almost disappears. We're actually proud of the fact that at times, it's overtly architectural. and At times, it's so subtle, you hardly know it's there. It does emerge and become very significant, a kind of clear portal. So the architecture has a real iconography and work to do. But we also like to think that depending on the season, it can ultimately appear and disappear. Uh, this is very much a, pro uh, a bit of a, 
uh, project that is in progress, so you'll see parts of it built and parts of it um, still in the design phase. This is Hunter's Point uh, South Waterfront Park in New York, and you can start to see that its location on the East River is incredibly strategic with views of the Queensboro Bridge, the UN, the Empire State Building, just this incredibly panoramic setting. But it's a setting, like many urban settings, that's had an incredibly rich and varied and at times violent history. Um, it was an incredibly rich marshland pre-colonial times, then became a, a kind of, when New York was one of the kind of major industrial centers, became an active shipping and coal container transfer point, so a heavy industry. But also, as we all are discovering, waterfront communities are increasingly vulnerable. So it was very important for us to start to think about rising water tides, rising water currents. And we started this project before Hurricane Sandy. We were given a very idiosyncratic site that will now start to host about 4,000 units of affordable housing, which is crucial in many of our urban settings, the sort of sense of trying to make a community that is affordable. So we're proud of the fact that this has a sort of a, a real social agenda. The park takes that idiosyncratic waterfront and idiosyncratic shoreline and turns it into a series of events, sort of much like a necklace with a series of charms on it. And the hidden agenda, of course, was to think about rising water tides. And what we uh, strove to do is to kind of reclaim the waterfront in a way that one could start to think of it as a sort of soft sponge. So rather than fight the kind of uh, rising tides, how could we accommodate them and turn them into something much more poetic and beautiful? So here is the situation at low tide. Here is the 500-year storm. Now, the Parks Department and the Planning Department were very nervous about us sharing this. In fact, we were told not to. So we talked about a series of uh, ecological corridors, interpretive corridors, site circulation, green infrastructure. And this was, in a way, the backbone of the park. And you never like to say, we told you so. But um, one of the things that's amazing is this park survived Hur Hurricane Sandy. It was about 95% finished when it was completely engulfed with water and managed to absorb the impact of that storm. Um, but this uh, shows that even what appears to be benign landscapes, particularly in urban areas, are heavily engineered, reimagined, redesigned, and bear the history of multiple eras. So that history allows us to reintroduce in what is currently the setting of the southern end of the park a new um, marshland, uh, a new ecological belt, this sort of green sponge that will allow us to kind of absorb water and create uh, an incredible promontory to take in the spectacle of the city. So nature and city coexist, they're not antithetical. And I think this idea of nature and city coexisting really also leverages the possibility of borrowed landscapes that are not necessarily on our property or nine acres, but something very, very close that's so compelling, such as Manhattan skyline became a protagonist in the design. So you can see that what you're looking at here is the pavilion, the shade pavilion framing the recreational green and multi-use green. And this was a green that actually had hard work to do with the new school and also hard work to do in terms of resilience. So that in the case of a flood, the water could actually come in, be held, and then released rather as quickly as possible to make its way back out um, to that front. Now you can start to see this this kind of uh, oval, if you will, being complemented by a crescent. That's a, a state of negotiation between Parks Department and Fine Arts of regular turf and artificial turf. But the pavilion itself is really a backbone to some of the activities. It has Parks Department, restrooms, concessions, shade pavilion, uh, ferry terminal, all of these coming together as part of these extended and habitable strands that host the different you know, high use areas of the dog run, the rail yards, the playgrounds, etc. Biggest social center in all of Manhattan seems to be not in Manhattan, but here at the Dog Run. Um, but the the legacy of this industry is one that now could actually host an extraordinary landscape, a new sort of rejuvenated landscape. And the former beach, Water Taxi Beach, much beloved, was relocated here so that uh, people under the age of 25 with beverages could actually enjoy it as well. Um, those of you who know Water Taxi Beach, it had a strange reputation, but. Um, 
What you can look at here, though, is the pavilion, and the pavilion is actually very, very hard working. It's what makes this park energy neutral. It has a solar collecting rooftop, which actually then powers all the lights in the park, and it also has a kind of water collecting gutters, which then handles all the irrigation. And so you can see this structure, of course, with the holes or the gaps so that it doesn't fly up through uplift, um, with columns coming down to a pair of points rather than four points that then frame these extraordinary views um, of the ferry terminal out of Manhattan. And what we're most excited about is it really becomes uh, a place not so much of control but of change and temporality and a place where people can actually experience both being away from the city and to experience the city, um, which we think is a city like no other. Um, but this question now of what it means to actually welcome people under the aegis or under a celestial soffit, if you will, to become invited into places that are private but have a public realm is true in the Novartis campus. And Novartis is a, a wonderful pharmaceutical company that uh, has locations in Switzerland but also here uh, in North America. And what they were very interested in doing, and we'll show two projects, I'll show one, Michael will show the other, is through architecture host the qualities and the welcome, if you will, through the terms of design so that in this case a visitor center is also a place of, in fact, airside and landside control just like an airport. Um, but we decided that it would be great to actually leverage this incredible landscape as a, as a player or protagonist in here as well and then create a celestial soffit overhead so that even at night when you come by the campus you could say that this is a great place of welcome and change and research, and that it's one that you would be welcome to, as long as you were invited in, uh, to <clears throat> be introduced to that, and that somehow it's a place where, through great effort, things can feel effortless and become possible. So what you can see here is that with the arrival of place of control, this is where you check in, this is where you wait, this is where your, your, uh, your ride will pick you up and take you through the campus. But through this threshold or portal, really, is you come out another side, and in that side, you're strictly in the garden and in the landscape. And at that point, it's a landscape that really does define your first experience of their campus. And that's really leading to other parts of the campus um, as well. So the other part of this project, kind of hardworking uh, part, is a, uh, an office building, uh, actually a dry lab as well. And here the idea, which I, I think is certainly evident on a campus like this, is the bifurcation, the binary uh, opposition of work and play is increasingly dissolving. So we go to Starbucks with our computer and uh, talk. Um, likewise, we bring food into a library. So these two kinds of worlds are increasingly commingled in, in healthy ways, actually. This was part of a master plan that was um, uh, defined by uh, Vittorio Lampugnani, who uh, gave each architect a kind of very simple rectangular box to work within. And I think earlier today we talked with students about the value of constraint, the value of constraint in art and architecture, and even science is liberating. So the idea of taking the box and introducing a kind of Mobius strip of more public work areas, places of interaction where people could have coffee, share drinks, talk about the research they were doing became crucial in terms of providing an alternative to the highly striated um, work area. So you can see in the kind of early sketch, the kind of charcoal sketch that talks about taking this box and carving it in a way that allows you to create a series of ascending living rooms that are marked by uh, maple, wood, that kind of track around the building and always provide settings where researchers can interact with each other. And it also allowed us to kind of define this very crystalline box with a sort of opposing ascending route. So you had the kind of primacy, uh, primacy of the box and then the route gets marked in the facade. The building is very simple. It's a loft building. It can change. Research uh, is always changing. So uh, research teams are changing in size from 6 to 60. The average stay and the average uh, sort of uh, team is about six months. So flexibility is crucial. So the envelope and the floor levels are extremely simple. But it's clad in a very high performing uh, combination of different kinds of glass that at times mirror the sky, uh, whether it's a beautiful blue day or a much more somber day. Um, 
But we talked about the importance of collaboration, and here we worked with an incredible, incredibly talented uh, team of engineers, including uh, or led by uh, Ed Messina. So what's really interesting about this project from an engineering point of view is that the primary public areas that kind of crisscross the building are completely column free. So in order to do that, everything above those sort of uh, public promenades are suspended from a series of, of really incredibly heroic uh, beams, and then everything below is supported off a more conventional structural system. So you can see that area is completely column free, and you can start to see how it's marked on the exterior. And I, I think we probably uh, shortened Ed Messina's life by maybe 10 years uh, because uh, the loads are not only, uh, they're also dynamic because this thing is ascending in a kind of spiral so you can imagine the challenge. And fortunately, I think he embraced uh, the uh, technical bravura that was required. But we were also interested in a high performing envelope and this is in a very beautiful Sylvan setting. So glass is introduced, glass in this case we always think of as being transparent. And here we like the crystalline quality that would reflect the landscape, but it's also etched so that glass has a sort of softness. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, on some other projects where we have been uh, similarly experimenting with different kinds of glass. Glass is also fritted, and you can start to see the mock-ups that would test thermal efficiency and the ability to harvest daylight. And then, of course, from the outside, as the landscape matures, um, you'll get this incredible reciprocity. These are the kind of public areas which are marked with um, low iron glass, the clearest kind of glass available. And you can start to see how these public rooms then are lined with wood. They become the kind of social lubricant. And um, of course, everything centers around coffee when you're doing research. So there's incredible coffee here and easy chairs because we recognize that collaboration requires a sort of sense of intimacy and a sense of conversation. And how you, you can start to see how you can look into these living rooms from the more um, simple and uh, flexible work area. So there's always a sense of being part of a community rather than being stratified by floor. On the southern end, of course, this wraps around and then it becomes an outdoor terrace. Occasionally it is nice on the east coast. Uh, we long for days like the one we have had today. Um, we're currently working in a similar vein on a very interesting project. Uh, Cornell and the Technion in Israel are setting up a campus on Roosevelt Island. It's one of the few opportunities to be involved in the sort of establishment of a campus. And coincidentally, I should say, after about almost 20 years of practice, Mary and I finally have two projects that are on the East River. And uh, hopefully one day we'll take a water taxi to both of those. Um, but Roosevelt Island is this rather unique little split of land in the middle of the East River. So it fronts Queens and Manhattan. And there you see the site of this uh, incredibly uh, interesting emerging research uh, university. Um, and it started with a master plan by uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And you can start to see the development. Uh, first, two buildings, our building and a building by uh, Tom Main's office, Morphosis three, four, five, and then seven, eight, nine buildings. Our site was this kind of rather, how should we say it graciously, lumpen um, a block of space on an otherwise magical island. So of course the first thing that you do is how do you kind of transform this sort of lumpen mass into something more interesting. And our thought was to take this rather large footprint and break it into two so that we could capture what is so unique about being on an island. You can see two sides. And that's magical about Roosevelt Island because it's a very narrow island. So the building, in a way, becomes a lens to view both Manhattan and Queens. And similarly, um, we thought to elevate the landscape, bring it into the building, not only to increase the sort of level of interaction and socialization, but also, again, recognizing that water levels will rise over the next 50, 60 years. And that kind of transformation allows us to think of pulling the kind of primary campus up into the building. So often the kind of life of a campus occurs in the outside spaces and then the inner spaces become much more prosaic and less interactive. And here the level of interaction was crucial. So Michael's talked about interaction and nobody knows interaction uh, leading to combustible sort of uh, experiences that 
change, change the culture of a place like Silicon Valley. And so you could look at the startup garage here as one paradigm, and you could look at the directed learning in a classroom as another paradigm. And what Cornell Tech is very interested in doing is fusing the speed and the characteristics of both of these into one building. And so as Michael described, this leveraging through and breaking, uh, breaking in half to actually open the building up was not just so much about actually breaking that through and letting light in, but it was really structuring worlds that actually had limitless windows so that the centerpiece of this hourglass is where collaboration might occur. And at that centerpiece, that's where the sort of light and landscape gets pulled up and through the building, and the kind of prismatic lens around actually frames this kind of social topography inside with uh, research and collaborative spaces on the outside, and then social collaborative spaces on the inside with great views out to actually form a new landmark ultimately on the East River. Now this idea of landmark and landscape is something that had a very different uh, sort of hidden agenda at Barnard College, uh, which is part of Columbia University but still independent. And there it was a case of 100,000 square feet that needed to actually find itself on a campus of only four and three and quarter acres. And so here you can see the main gate but once inside the main gate, there's this extraordinary kind of oasis of two landscapes, one visible above Lehman Lawn and one hidden below uh, in the Mill Millbank Court. The new sort of arts center, if you will, the Diana Center, needed to actually land on this footprint, what used to be the campus center in the 1960s. You could see this was the attitude about women in the city, a little different <laughs> than it is now. But nonetheless, we looked at that and when we started to think about making a large building, the real question was, well, let's not just make a building, but let's connect a disconnected campus. Those two landscapes were separated by about 20 feet. And then why not connect all the programs of theater, architecture, art, dance, performance, dining, library, classrooms, and allow the spatial moves, the sectional moves of a landscape to also cut through the building's multi-floors to actually transform this particular paradigm, single story, into a multi-story sort of luminous lens of what Barnard is about. Now this is the Broadway side, uh, but if we come into the campus side, this was the separation of these two landscapes that so troubled us that when you were in the <coughs> historic part, you couldn't see the main gate. So with some criticism about tearing down the bowling alley, um, we actually removed the bowling alley, but still created some classrooms, but connected with a new landscape a, a, a sort of campus core which was defined by landscape. We also tapered the building to reveal the gate and then leveraged this idea of the spatial sectional connection into the programmatic connection inside the building so that when you're in the cafe, you could look up to the dining areas, to the library reading room, and to the gallery critique space and this kind of collapsing telescopic view of peripheral vision that would allow you complete visual access to everything, albeit acoustical privacy, was something that was very important. And then from the uh, event and sort of uh, architecture and art critique space at the very, very top, you could look down to the reading room, dining, et cetera, and see the unfolding programs, or in some cases, just see through the fritted glass to see something altogether private in this public setting. So you start to see the section of the building. About a third of the building is below grade because we really want to make sure the height of the building matched its neighbors and the spaces below grade require less light. So there's the black box theater, which is a sort of functioning machine for theatrical performances. Above that is the event space, it's sort of like being inside a violin. It can house dance, theatrical performances, musical performances, and lectures and symposia. And then above that, the other two thirds of the building rise up and help define Lehman Lawn, and in New York City, every little bit of green space is absolutely precious. So this was an extraordinarily important uh, little spot of grass that needed to be preserved. So the building in a way fronts it and gives it definition. And our client jokes that the fire stair here, which crisscrosses the edge of the building, is probably the least most efficient fire stair and the most expensive. And I think we would argue sometimes inefficiency produces good architecture and produces good spaces. Um, but that stair actually, in a way, is, is extraordinarily efficient because it's also a linear gallery. It's a place where you can look into the building but also look out onto the campus. And finally, it descends and becomes a setting for choreography. I think if our insurer saw this photograph, they would absolutely <laughs> freak out. Um, but we love the idea that parts of architecture, if they're gracious enough, can be hosts to a number of programs. 
So you see the stairs sliding up. It kind of terminates in what else? The architecture studio. Um, and the building, in fact, is clad in a series of about 1,100, we think 47 panels of glass, different kinds of glass. And part of the glass was a material that we had been exploring for quite some time. And here you see an early sketch, and we wanted the kind of quality of the sketch, the kind of roughness of the paper, to also be embedded in the glass. So the glass is acid etched, fritted, and color integral, and it has a number of sort of properties. And of course, it is a way in which we can kind of link chromatically this building to its neighbors. Uh, Columbia has primarily a brick campus, so the thinking was what kind of red, and we discover there are about 47 different shades of red. And that, in turn, allowed us to test this out in situ. So you can start to see, alternately, the building is very bright, almost an orange red, depending on whether the sun hits it directly. And at times, it becomes much more uh, somber, a little more bronze-like. And you can see it matching the incredibly beautiful McKinley and White uh, uh, buildings of Columbia University on the other side of Broadway. So if the building was, as Marion described, a fortress to keep women uh, protected from the horrors of New York City, um, well, now we'd like to think that Barnard, which has an incredible array of programs, can have its own Tiffany window, in a way, on Broadway. So this is the second to the last uh, project we'll show, which is the Singh Center for Nanotechnology, recently opened at the University of Pennsylvania. The University of Pennsylvania, like Stanford, and like many urban campuses, is growing. And the campus is growing eastward, in this case, toward the city. So it was very important. You see the, the, the uh, building in red. It kind of, our attempt was to think not only of the architecture, but also the way in which it might frame a courtyard, which was so beautiful in the original historic part of Penn's campus. And in fact, this building is part of a rather bleak um, neighborhood of less than distinguished buildings, uh, not a speck of green space in sight. And here you can start to see the site. And the identification of that site became quite crucial because it's a hinge between the city and the campus. But it's also an opportunity for hosting incredible research, incredibly uh, sophisticated pieces of equipment that required incredibly uh, sophisticated and carefully calibrated climate control and vibration control. So there's a real sweet spot. And that sweet spot then gets wrapped by uh, other programs that are less exacting in their needs, like stairs, circulation, meeting spaces. And you can see how the idea sort of evolved of this kind of geode, in a way, around the courtyard that would take form and take shape. In a way, reintroduce the idea of a, a courtyard, a series of labs, and then allowing those labs to capture natural light, which is often somewhat antithetical. So here you see the building as it just opened. And uh, we love to talk about the kind of armature of the building. Again, um, happily, uh, Ed Messina decided to work with us after the excruciating Novartis experience. So I think he's either a brilliant engineer, a masochist, or both. But uh, we love the idea that he collaborated to come up with innovative ways of dealing with a 68-foot cantilever, which is huge, and um, particularly when vibration needs to be minimized. That cantilever also carries lateral loads, which you see on the horizontal triangle. And that, those lateral loads then also allow us to, in a way, create a, a shape and give measure to the courtyard. And so interesting thing, it's worth mentioning that our, uh, part of our client team, the dreamer, Eduardo Blanth, the dean of engineering, said, uh, I am passionate about art, I am passionate about science, and I am passionate about them together. And so you can see that he found a Tony Smith uh, that's at, act, actually at the base. Uh, but he also then found with us, as we had said, that there was beauty in the science itself. And he wanted that to be pulled up and revealed to everybody. So when we'd been to clean rooms and seen a little yellow portal door in these otherwise dark spaces, we were asking what's up with the yellow. And that keeps the uh, ultraviolet rays out of this very precious research. So we said, well, what if we pulled it all up and the entire wall was yellow? And nobody could think of a reason to say no. And so that's how the clean room made its way into a public uh, realm, almost a gallery space in and of itself. Um, what you see here, though, is that the lab floors are 20 feet floor to floor. That's very, very high. Um, but we wanted to reveal everything um, that was opening up. 
and reveal the sizes through the lens, if you will, of this uh, amber glass. And that you could actually look into these spaces, which are very high tech, rather extraordinary, and their infrastructure is every bit as compelling as the actual research being done. And then in spaces where the amber light wasn't so critical, we could actually reveal that here in the microscopy characterization suites, the full natural light, which we pulled into the lowest level by pulling the land down. But connecting all these floors together was very, very important. Everybody knows about elevators, and elevators have uh, vibration problems and uh, EMI, electromagnetic interference, and so those had to be at remote ends of the building. So we had to d develop, in, in a sense, the most irresistible stair possible so everybody would use it rather than the elevators. Um, you can see a Jaume Plenza now uh, also uh, at that intersection. But this staircase then, as it ascends, has three uh, collaborative lounges, if you will. So every stair has some narrative of bringing people out of their labs and into the public area and into the light. Um, and it's sent into eyesight of each other so that the possibility of collaboration would be more intuitive as opposed to something that you schedule. And so that even when you get to the very, very top here, when you're actually at this extraordinary uh, cantilever space, there's a lounge outside that looks back to the campus and a space inside that can host 150 for seminars, lectures, symposia, and conferences. Um, but it really is something that is, again, uh, part of the engineering territory on Penn, and that engineering itself is something that needed some dark as well. And so on the back side of the building where the labs wanted to have no light, you could start to see that we illuminated only with a folding metal pleated skin. And that skin is one that kind of operated and changed, and actually with its reflective and refractive qualities would actually start to collaborate with the glass crystal. But those surfaces are hard working on the perimeter, but the other perimeter, if you will, is the roof. And the stormwater collection and the stormwater detention is both performative at the mechanical spaces, but also social uh, at the roofscape. So that somehow simultaneously, we love this view, you could see art, science, nature, landscape, and city all at once. Um, and that all at once is something that's evident uh, by night as well. And when you walk on the street now, there is this wonderful sensation that somehow the sciences, which had been in research and engineering, which had been so uh, quiet and in a sense so concealed is now part of a public terrain. So this question of actually public terrain in our last project became very, very, uh, if you will, fraught and exciting because it was seen through the lens of art in Seattle on a piece of land uh, on the Puget Sound that had actually been created artificially through the Denny Regrade where in the 30s there was a hosing down of the bluff to actually create new land uh, that was welcomed by many, but not by those who would not sell. Um, they regretted not selling after a while, and pretty soon uh, the land was formed. And so what you can see here is everything from this piece of site was fraught, if you will, by an arterial highway, train tracks, a crumbling seawall, and contaminated land because it had been Union Oil of California's uh, transfer facility. So when the Seattle Art Museum said they wanted to create one park free and open to the public for art. They said if we have enough money like Millennium Park, we could cover up all that infrastructure with one piece, if you will, to create one park. But we said, well, that would be a shame. What if you could actually take these extraordinary forces that shape this site and let those lines actually somehow shape and inform the idea of a park that might open up and be a kind of landscape or landform that would begin in the city and wander to the water's edge and somehow cross these lines and keep them alive at the same time. This was our competition entry, easier said than done. Um, but it was really about building this new topography that was a chameleon in some sort, directed so that you would have specific views of the city, specific views of the sound, of the industry area, and also make your way across this incredible landscape into this new setting. And so what you can see here is the kind of formation of these nine and a half acres that actually, as we were scratching our head after we won the competition, we said, oh my god, you know, we've got all this stuff to deal with, an arterial highway, train tracks, contaminated sea well, and if we really have our act together, we could create salmon habitat and potentially get federal funding on the waterfront. So if you get systemic and start to think about these in terms of layers, it really is the layering of all these different systems of an agenda for landscape, art, infrastructure, urban life, and even contamination of soil being encapsulated, that those simultaneously can actually come together to create something that doesn't say either or, but all at once. 
and here is the kind of landscape and landform being constructed. Um, we had a fantasy about fabulous poured in place concrete walls, it's schematic design, they well exceeded the budget. So we started working with high, highway engineering ideas here of MSC or mechanically stabilized earth to build up the land and then clad that now with precast walls that had the added benefit through their overlap of being seismically uh, agile, if you will, if there was a seismic event. So you can start to see them being installed here, actually creating literally a setting so that the art, in this case the Calder, overlooking the Olympic Mountains for which the park is named, could be seen in a way that had never been seen before. So that the idea of what had just been a steep hill could be leveraged to actually be an entry into our pavilion that could actually have park accommodate parking below, a portal and gateway above, and actually unfold much, much like the way the land had unfolded at a smaller scale to host a building, so that we could actually see the perimeter of the city through the building and see the whole landscape and the art through the wedges or the breaks or the cuts to host different events inside in a very loose fit spontaneous way and to actually allow the datum of the car to be actually exactly parallel to where the view is in this pavilion um, and that those parallel tracks could actually be followed all along from building to landscape so that things like a valley, which are both 100% artificial but should feel 100% natural, could host the work of people like Richard Serra's Wake, which is so extraordinary, or could also host the Yoga Club of Seattle. Um, so the whole idea of all at once and simultaneous and public in nature was also one where the question of what infrastructure might be and what it might look like could actually be a place of crossing, both for cars and for people. So if the point of the park, literally, uh, metaphorically and, and symbolically, is the point, as Marion said, it allowed us to develop a series of perspectival convergences in a way like a golf course by sort of rearranging the route. It makes it appear much, much larger. And these little points have become extraordinary places for people to congregate and get photographed to the extent that we've come back to this project, reinforce them, and you can start to see how people use things in ways that had been both anticipated and not in surprising and wonderful ways. So the park is always changing depending on the time of year and depending on the art program. And in turn, sometimes the grasses are actually designed to become very, very, very bright, uh, almost a yellow uh, kind of hay color so that the sort of temporality is enhanced. So as you work your way down toward the water, the final sort of leg of infrastructure, which had been previously an extraordinary barrier, is given a sort of role in a way that kind of infrastructure becomes part of the program of the park. And what's magical is you get these incredibly beautiful trains sliding under the park effectively and becoming, in a way, kinetic sculpture. And it allowed us to work with an artist, in this case, Teresita Fernandez, to create a very beautiful throw fence, so even something as prosaic as a throw fence, becomes an opportunity to illuminate parts of the park. And there's an incredibly robust arts program. Um, many of these pieces were actually designed in a very specific way. It started with one piece, which is the Calder, um, and that in a way becomes the emblem of the park. And here you can see Marion showed you the Richard Serra piece. Believe it or not, these were uh, fabricated in New York City and then shipped cross country. So in a way, the choreography of these pieces is every bit as beautiful. And here's Richard, uh, you know, the proud father, uh, standing next to these incredibly weighty but lyrical pieces of steel. And here they are embedded in the landscape and a counterpoint to our pavilion. So if his piece is all about weight and gravity, a much more fragile idea about art and biology uh, is housed in this kind of green pavilion. And here, a sculpture by Mark Dion called Seattle Vivarium becomes a living sculpture. Um, we're told that, uh, I'm sure the curators are not happy to know this, but this will have a lifespan of 80 years. But it's as much about science and art coexisting. In this uh, incredible setting, uh, Seattle is a magical city. And then finally, if Seattle is a magical city, it's also a city about its waterfront. So this was an incredible opportunity to reclaim the waterfront from uses like this parking lot. So now it's a setting for someone to take a nap, I suppose, ride a bike uh, for the more uh, energetic 
and for children to wander off and do what they do, which is get out of the way of their parents. Um, but it's also a setting that allows us to recapture a softened waterfront, a waterfront where nature and art can coexist. Here's a sculpture by Jaume Plenze. It almost looks like Photoshop, doesn't it? It's incredible how uh, art mirrors life and life mirrors art. But as Marian said, it was a chance to uh, think about a number of ecological measures, including restoring habitat, which was so central to the city. And uh, we had a moment of value engineering. We could only afford about 10 logs. And happily, a storm came along. Uh, so uh, sometimes nature is gracious and generous. Um, but this uh, new waterfront, which allows someone to actually touch the water, is completely engineered. And um, there is nothing artificial about it. It comes through hydrology and really uh, careful science. And our role, in a way, was a sort of handmaiden to make this kind of happen. And so there is now salmon habitat that's been tracked by Washington University. And we think of this as just as beautiful a garden as what we typically see above. And we like to think that art can coexist in ways that it might not have coexisted with architecture and with landscape in this incredible setting. So we'd like to conclude this talk with a series of views here, the ideal and the circumstantial, the infrastructural and the temporal are collapsed to suggest a new form of public nature, one which expands the physical and philosophical terms of an architecture, an architecture that can both critique and transform reality. Thank you. Or you can just shout. No question? Why don't you come to the mic, so it gets on the recording. The work is obviously wonderful. I, I noticed a theme uh, that there's, there, there's a lot more movement, kind of upwards and downwards. There's, there's much more movement than many other architects that, that we've witnessed in this room. And I, I just wondered. Is it, is it one or both of you, or, or what's the inspiration? You know, what, what's the design thing that, that gets you to be oh, oh, kind of yeah. pulling your, your yeah. you yeah. know, things up and down yeah. and sideways yeah. to, to get that sort of movement? I, I would say that um, that's a good observation. The notion of promenade, which you saw with the Spanish Steps, uh, has been an inspiration for both of us. But the sense of movement and topography has really been an instinctive idea about introducing the kind of public walk or movement as a place of engagement. And sometimes the space of architecture is just seen as rooms. And in our mind, the space of architecture really is most compelling when it's also a place of movement. And so that really is a thread that in some case actually shapes the work every bit as much as hosting the program itself. I think part of it too is driven by our interest in, in landscape and the site, the space, even an urban setting like Barnard, the space outside a building. and. Um, uh, we found that many of our projects are multi-level buildings that are, by virtue of their sort of segregation by floor, are, are uh, asocial. And increasingly, research, art, requires a level of collaboration. So how you move up and through, how can architecture actually introduce a sort of an idea of peripheral vision, an idea that the offhand encounters are as important as the systematic programmed events. Thank you. Thank you.